Welcome to the programme. It's lovely to have you with us this morning. We begin the show in Indonesia, where rescue teams are using drones and sniffer dogs to search for survivors along the coastline of Java and Sumatra. At least 373 people are now known to have been killed when a tsunami struck on Saturday. That was triggered by an eruption of the Anak Krakatau volcano. More victims are expected, uh, with over 200, uh, 100 sorry, and 20 people still missing. Thousands of residents remain at higher ground after a high tide warning was extended until tomorrow. Antonia Oliveira is Silva has more. Efforts to recover hundreds of bodies continue on the ground. Rescuers work along a 100 kilometer stretch of coast. Here, in the province of Batan, island of Java, they say it's not too late to find survivors. We're carrying out rescue operations with the help of the army, the police and members of civil society. We're looking for potential survivors between rubble and debris. All the wreckage is as it was after the tsunami. It hasn't been touched with heavy machinery yet. With the same hope, many continue their search for relatives in hospitals like this one in Pandeglang. There, survivors like Muhammad try to recover. He was hit by a wave while playing at the beach. At first I heard a war in the distance. My friend was looking for where the war came from, but as they did not run, I continued playing. I thought maybe it was a war from the sky. When we heard the second war, water up two meters high, heat us. Monday night, authorities remained alert, fearing a new disaster. The Christian community attended Christmas Eve services in local churches. Prayers and donations were made for the victims of Saturday's disaster. In this year's Christmas celebrations, we're both happy but deeply saddened by the tragedy that befell our brothers and sisters, especially those who live near the coast near the Serang district and Padeglang. Some of our church members are also victims of this tragedy. The tsunami waves crashed into western Java and southern Sumatra Islands. The accident followed a volcanic eruption of Anakrakatau, one of the world's most infamous volcanic islands. Scientists say the tsunami was triggered by an underwater landslide following the partial collapse of the erupting volcano. The Indonesian Meteorology Agency says an area of the island equivalent to 90 football fields collapsed into the sea. Anton Oliveri Silva, Euro News. NBC's Sarah Hardman is in Siligon in Indonesia. She sent us this report. Christmas morning dawned here in Indonesia, full of death and destruction. More than 300 people now confirmed dead, more than 100 others still missing. And there are concerns the worst isn't over yet. As the volcano continues to rumble, there are worries there could be another tsunami. So people are being warned to avoid these low-lying coastal areas. Overnight, there was a service held to remember those who lost their lives and to pray for those who are still missing. Many of the people who were in the affected area were families on vacation, people who were out hoping to enjoy a fun, a fun that turned into a nightmare. Questions are now turning to why the country doesn't have a better early warning system for tsunamis. The president himself, Joko Widodo, addressing that issue as he visited an yesterday. For now, Indonesia is left picking up the pieces again. That was Sarah Hardman uh, in Siligon in Indonesia there. Well, Jan Gelfand uh, from the Red Cross is in Jakarta. Uh, he's been coordinating some of the organization's ongoing rescue efforts, and he joins us uh, again this morning from Jakarta. Good morning uh, to you, Mr. Gelfand. Thank you for being with us again uh, this morning. My pleasure. Merry, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, I imagine not a very Merry Christmas because, of course, your rescue efforts are continuing. Uh, we saw there in Sarah's report the heavy rainfall. We're seeing, you know, we saw her standing in the midst of that that rain, low visibility, what does that mean for the rescue efforts? 
Well, it makes it uh, much more difficult for, at one end, it's difficult for people that are still searching for people that could be alive. And please remember that people will try as hard as they can. Rescue workers will work until the last possible moment to try to find people that are alive. But it makes it more difficult because they don't want to put themselves and others into danger by because all the debris is wet, making it dangerous. It makes it hard for goods to get in. It makes it hard. It increases the chance for people to to have health-related problems because of getting wet and not having adequate shelter. So it just complicates every different area that <clears throat> we're all trying to work on. Even our own volunteers, the 250 volunteers from the Indonesian Red Cross, are trying to make sure that they stay safe so that they can continue doing the work that they've already started since the, since the uh, tsunami occurred. Absolutely. And we know that Java's uh, west coast was, was more intensely hit. That's relatively easy to access. But what about the more remote areas? Now that you're getting into those more remote areas, what are you finding there? Well, it's the same thing. As you mentioned in your story, it's a long ways along the coast. But it's not just the coast of Sumatra and Java. There's also islands that are in the, in the ocean, smaller islands that are inhabited. Um, we've sent two helicopters so that we can get a better aerial assessment so that we can then send in teams when we need to and, and find. But you'll find more of the same thing because the, the tsunami doesn't go in one direction. It radiates out and hit a whole lot of different areas. Uh, and, of course, reports now, because the, the volcano uh, uh, is continuing uh, to rumble, the volcano that started all of this, fears of another uh, tsunami. What can people do uh, to keep safe? Well, I think that's uh, one of the things that all of our volunteers are doing and they're trained to do is to is to teach people and to have them aware of what's, uh, what are some of the signs. Um, we spent just two months ago, ironically, doing tsunami evacuation with communities that were affected by this one. Unfortunately, because of the nature of the, what caused the, the tsunami, it's very hard to, to have any warning. So people need to know that if there is any kind of a signal, anything that indicates they have to stay at a higher ground, they have to stay aware that if there's the noises that some of the people heard, and they have to just be vigilant for themselves, for their family members, for their community members. In this case, it was also complicated because so many people were there for vacation. So they would not be necessarily aware of all of these different, uh, <clears throat> different things that they can do in order to be prepared. Are you satisfied uh, that the preparations for any further uh, tsunami or, or devastation uh, are adequate? Well, we never think that people can ever be as prepared as they need to be. But I think that the government has shown and the president has said that they need to improve this system. Uh, this is a big country with a lot of coastline. It's not an easy thing to have the resources in order to, um, you know, to be able to make sure the whole country is, is prepared. It's, it's, a, it's a huge, huge, huge area. But they're trying. They're understanding this is the third event that's, that's hit the country in less than six months. And I think that you have a, a situation where the government now knows it has to do more and the population now knows that they have to take heed for this and also prepare themselves. Australia has announced that it will introduce new surveillance technology at airports to crack down on drones in the new year. Uh, to discuss this uh, some more, I'm joined by Peter Gibson, Communications Manager for the Civil Aviation Safety Authority in Australia. Good morning to you, Mr Gibson, and Merry Christmas to you. Thank you uh, for spending time with us on your Christmas Day to talk about this. Um, uh, now, no problem. Tight uh, new rules in Australia. We know that uh, there'll be no flying more than 120 metres above the ground, for example. No flying within 5.5 kilometres uh, of controlled uh, aerodromes. Um, and fines of up to $10,000 or even starting at $10,000. But do you think people opening up their Christmas presents today and, and finding a drone inside are going to know those rules and know how to abide by them? Well, that is the challenge, absolutely. And one of the things we're going to do later this year is, uh, next year, sorry, 2019, is uh, bring in a uh, national registration scheme. So we'll make sure that everybody who uh, buys a drone, and indeed everyone who's currently got a drone, registers those. So we'll have some direct contact with them. Uh, at the moment, as you say, the challenge is getting people to understand there are rules and follow them. Uh, we do a lot of education information on that. We're very active on social media. We've just got to keep plugging that uh, and uh, and re re you know and reinforce, as you say, there are big penalties, including uh, jail terms for people who do uh, seriously wrong things with their drones. What about someone who travels to another country where the rules are different? How? Uh, what would you advise them to do? 
Yeah, well, look, that's a challenge for us as well because we get a lot of tourists, say, down at Sydney Harbour who just aren't uh, aware that you can't fly a drone uh, over uh, Sydney Harbour around the Opera House or the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they do that and unfortunately uh, cause problems. So, look, that's a challenge as well. We've got to work with uh, incoming airlines, uh, airports to get those sort of messages across. But, yeah, people who are travelling, look, you really got to check out the country you're going to, uh, you know, jump on uh, Google and uh, work out uh, what the local rules are and respect those. Because as we saw at Gatwick, the rules are there for really good reasons to uh, protect uh, aircraft, to protect people, to protect property, uh, and we need people to follow them. I've got one very quick uh, question uh, for you. When you looked at Gatwick and what was going on in the UK there, uh, what did you think could have been done better? Well, it's hard to say from this far away, but certainly uh, we've got coming uh, drone surveillance technology, which we'll be using at our major airports, which will allow us to see in real time where drones are, where the controller is on the ground, and in most cases uh, read the serial number of the drone. So it'll give us uh, a much better enforcement tool to quickly uh, apprehend people who are breaking the rules and issue fines. Uh, and as well, uh, a number of our police forces have so-called drone guns, electronic devices, which can bring down drones. So I think you need those sort of tools in your armoury these days. Uh, otherwise, you are at risk of things like Gatwick happening. Martha Alonso, the governor of the central state of Puebla, has been killed in a helicopter crash. Her husband, uh, two crew members and a third passenger also died when their helicopter came down shortly after takeoff near the state capital. Alonso, Puebla's uh, first female governor, took office uh, earlier this year in a hotly contested election that was marred by accusations of fraud.